Hi, my name is Sarah Pagliaccio, and welcome to my talk on bias in AI and design. First, I'd like to start with the definition of AI. Artificial intelligence is a computer science that runs on machine learning and big data. Machine learning means asking for what you want with examples instead of giving the computer explicit instructions like in traditional computer science. I liken it to the memory games we played as kids or with our own kids. You show the computer a picture of a horse and it labels it um, as a horse or something else. Um, you do this across a large data set of pictures, so a large bunch of pictures, uh, and you tell the computer if it's right or wrong. And it learns from your scoring of its answers as being right or wrong, what a horse is versus the other things that are in your photo data set. There are many th examples of AI out in the world being put to good use today, including recommendations engines like in Netflix or Spotify, sorting your email into spam and not spam. Uh, there are emerging examples in other industries, including tumor detection in healthcare that can reduce human error uh, and save lives. But not all of these AI powered tools are actually helping people. For example, the predictive algorithms that power Gmail and Microsoft's suggested text uh, could regurgitate racial and other biases that are contained in the underlying training material. Or worse, the predictive text software could exacerbate hate speech anywhere people type text into an app or an email messages, SMS messages, social media posts, in-app messaging conversations. Imagine typing the words, black people should be, what do you get next? Here's an example of AI gone wrong from msn.com. The team at Microsoft uh, recently decided to replace human journalists with robots the AI software illustrated a news story about racism with a photo of the wrong mixed race member of the band Little Mix. The machines couldn't tell the differences between these two women in a story about racism. <clears throat> Last year, Twitter had to look into why the AI algorithm it uses to generate photo previews apparently chooses to show white people's faces more frequently than black faces. Uh, several Twitter users demonstrated this in posts that included both a black person and a white person. The Twitter's preview showed the white faces more often than the black faces, even when the two people mentioned were Mitch McConnell and former President Barack Obama. The problem is the training data the big tech companies are using are flawed. Research has shown that the machines believe men are computer programmers and women are homemakers. This research really woke people up to the issue of large scale bias in AI, but the problem still exists. It exists partly because women make up just 12% of AI researchers. These numbers are not improving, especially not this year when the pandemic forced more women out of the workforce than men. And coincidentally, Google recently forced the co-chiefs of their ethics and AI team out of their jobs, both women, for pointing out the bias in Google's own algorithms. We know that the problem is the training data because recent research disclosed that one of, at least one of the big tech companies uh, uses a facial, uh, sorry, uses a collection of images for the, to train its facial recognition software that is made up of more than 77% uh, male images and more than 83% white images. We also know that the tech community is largely white and male. And the arts community, although less male dominated, is also largely white and therefore susceptible to some of these biases, which is too bad because we are meant to be designing products and services that solve problems or sell products or communicate to people from all walks of life, not just white men. And meanwhile, it turns out that women drive 70 to 80% of the economy. And this is actually a statistic from a couple of years ago. In some industries, it's as high as 95%. Also, meanwhile, racism is costing the US economy $16 trillion. We ignore these non-white audiences, customers, users of our design solutions at our peril. Whether you realize it or not, these biases exist in any algorithm power tools, any Google search, any image generators, for instance, that you may already be using. And they can seep into our design processes when we're short on time or forced by budgets to cut corners. We fall back on familiar habits using recruitment pools made up of friends and family networks who are also going to be largely white because we're largely white. So what should we do? 
first of all, know that you can do better. Uh, you can act like an unbiased ally to become an unbiased ally. It's a fake it till you make it kind of principle. Take the implicit bias test. Know that implicit bias shows up in 70 to 75% of Americans who take the test. Don't have to post your results to social media. Just become a, more aware. Make your unconscious biases conscious biases so that you can actually work against them. Recruit outside your friends and family networks. Whenever you're designing something, you want to test that solution, you want to prototype it, you want to do user research, usability testing. Relying on our comfortable user groups can perpetuate these biases. We need to really force ourselves out of our regular comfort zones. Get over the discomfort of asking for demographic information. Somewhere along the way, this became gauche, but it's important to know who you've reached and who you haven't, and you won't know that if you don't ask these questions. Try recruiting someone to provide checks and balances on your design research, your usability testing, any conversations you're having with potential users. I find this particularly important myself because I'm a solo practitioner. I need to remind myself to reach out to other people just to make sure that my own unconscious bias isn't slipping into my design findings, my research findings and recommendations. And in the absence of human help, you can actually harness the tools I'm railing against uh, at least in the case of text sentiment analysis tools, uh, you can plug text into a text sentiment analysis API, and it'll tell you if the content, the words on the screen are positive or negative. This gives you an objective understanding of whether or not the words your research participants used were positive or negative. So you can take the transcripts from your interview surveys, any usability testing that you've done, you record those, you transcribe those, you put them through a text sentiment analysis tool, and it'll give you an objective understanding of whether or not people um, felt good or bad about the questions you were asking and the answers they were providing. Uh, it can really tell you how your users feel about a product or service, and you can use these numbers to create groovy graphs for your journey maps and customer experience maps as well, which is great to have that objective data added to any research findings. Thanks very much for your time and feel free to contact me if you have any questions.